good morning. It's the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. The confession of sin can be found on page 79 of your Book of Common Prayer. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia, the Lord has shown forth his glory. Come, let us adore him. We'll continue with Venite, found on page 82 of your Book of Common Prayer. together. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Our psalm for today is Psalm 139, verses 1 through 11 and 22 to 23 found on page 794 of your Book of Common Prayer. Together. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You have known my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O Lord, know it altogether. You press upon me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. Where can I go then from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I make the grave my bed, You are there also. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me, and the light around me turn to night, darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light to you are both alike. Search me out, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my restless thoughts. Look well whether there be any wickedness in me, and lead me in the way that is everlasting. A reading from Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 25. Brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. 
For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. The word of the Lord. Next, we will say the first song of Isaiah, found on page 86 of your Book of Common Prayer. Together. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my Savior. Therefore, you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And on that day, you shall say, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things. And this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion, ring out your joy. For the Great One in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, and 36 through 43. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No. For in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. 
Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. The Gospel of the Lord. Next we will say the Song of Mary, the Magnificat, found on page 91 of your Book of Common Prayer. Together. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your eyes, O God, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Last week we heard a fairly familiar story to most of us. It was the parable of the sower, S-O-W-E-R. It's the story about a person who goes out and seed is falling on different types of ground. It falls on rocky ground, falls on ground that's infested with thorns. Some of it falls on good ground. And the parable is really about the the fertile nature of our hearts when we hear about the kingdom of heaven. What kind of hearts do we have? Do we have rocky hearts where maybe it takes root for a short time and then dries up? Or do we have hardened hearts where the seeds never find any purchase at all? Do we have fertile hearts where the seeds of the kingdom can be planted and grows? Or maybe in the best case yet, Do we ourselves become like the sower, spreading the seeds of the good news of the kingdom of God? Not focused on uh, where we plant, not focused on if we plant only in the fertile soil or, or where, but spreading the word exuberantly. Not worrying about the conditions of the hearts of those who are receiving the word while we're planting the seeds of the gospel. But we let God tend to it. We don't withhold good news from anyone based on how we think that the results of that planting is. Well, today we hear a slightly less well-known parable, but one keeping with that same idea of planting, the same as the parable last week. This one is the parable of the weeds. And unlike last week, this parable begins with the seeds that have been sown in a good field, a fertile field, and it has resulted in wheat. And the wheat in the story are us children of God whose seed of the gospel has found its way into our hearts. The seed has taken root and the seed has grown. But now comes the twist in the story. In the middle of the night, already sounds pretty nefarious, doesn't it? In the middle of the night, his enemy comes and he sows weeds in with the wheat. And what results is this weed-like plant that gets intermingled with all of the wheat. Who plants these destructive weeds? It's the enemy of the farmer. The first question, and it's almost accusatory in tone when it comes from the farmhands, well, didn't you plant good seeds? So where does all this other stuff come from? Last week, uh, Father Sean used one of his favorite churchy words, theodicy. Not the odyssey, you know, the one written by Homer, and we are obligated to make that joke every time that word is used, but theodicy, it really boils down to the question of why does good things, or why does bad things happen to good people? Are you finally hoping to hear an answer to that? Why bad things happen to good people? I think I can safely say, after many years of of reading the Bible, doing Bible study, two years of discerning for holy orders, three years of going through formation, three years as an ordained person, that I can finally give you an answer. And the answer is, I have no idea. I can't uh, answer why uh, a drunk could plow into a minivan going down the road with a family, killing everyone in the car, and then the drunk walks away unscathed. I don't know why a a tornado would jump over five neighborhoods only to land in the neighborhood, the poorest one in town. I can't answer why, uh, well, someone like me, really, who probably should be ill, never gets seriously ill, and then someone who exercises every day in their life is perfectly healthy could just drop dead from a brain aneurysm. By the way, I would recommend a book to you to read. It's a short book, and it's on the subject, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, exactly what we're talking about. It's by Rabbi Harold Kushner. It's a fantastic read, one of the best ones that I've read on the topic. So I can't give you an answer to that. What I can is that for most of us, isn't our first reaction the same as the ones on the farm? Don't we want to turn to Jesus and ask Jesus, Master Did you not plant good seed? So if you planted the good seed, how is it that these people die in a car crash? How is it that that tornado only lands in the poorest neighborhood? 
And the only answer I can give you is the same answer that Jesus did. This is the result of the evil person who comes and plants those weeds. Evil has been released into the world. It's evil that wraps us up every day, all around us, infecting our lives. It's not the world that God intended for us, but it is by our consequences and our choices that evil grows around us. And there's this immediate reaction the hands have, and it's exactly like we probably would when we look at a problem. We see a problem, and we immediately want to fix it. We want to know how to fix it. Let's go out and pull up those weeds. But the farmer knows the damage that it will do if they pull it up. It's going to rip out the roots of both plants. They're so interwoven together that both would be destroyed. And so the answer becomes, wait. Wait until the harvest comes. Wait when the weeds will be separated from the good crops, and then they'll be bundled up and they'll be destroyed. The seeds sown by the enemy are the evil that grows around in parallel to all of us. At every stage of our existence, we are surrounded by evil. And I don't want to try to quantify it. You know, whether it's just a little bit of evil or if it's a whole lot of evil, evil is evil. And it surprises me and shocks me, really, in some regard when I hear people kind of dismiss the idea of, of evil in itself being in the world as anything more than just a, a man-made construct. You know, it's kind of like a, they almost take a flippant approach, like a Flip Wilson, for those of you who remember that show. Remember Flip would say, the devil made me do it. And we kind of half-hearted joke about it. I think the worst approach that we can take is not to question the evil in the world, that evil doesn't exist by some external force. I think some of us are reluctant to say that because maybe we feel embarrassed to. You know, we don't want to admit that there is such a force as evil in the world because our friends would imagine that we're kind of picturing that devil standing there in all his glory with, you know, the horns, the cloven hooves that, you know, make it hard for him to ski, red cape, pitchfork. That's cartoonish. And I think that, you know, if we saw that kind of image of Satan coming at us, this physical manifestation, we'd probably turn around in the other direction and you'd see a cartoonish cloud scooting right out from underneath of us. Evil is much more insidious. Evil isn't always a shout. Evil can be just a whisper in the ear. Evil can be the thoughts that Satan puts inside of our head, thoughts that we uh, are not good enough, thoughts that our brothers and sisters of the kingdom are not good enough, thoughts that these other people don't measure up. Thoughts that we know better for ourselves than God knows for us. That we don't need God. That we can depend only on ourselves. That evil is like those invasive weeds in the parable. That if we uh, let ourselves listen and get pulled in, they start to wrap around us. And they start wrapping tighter and tighter, just choking us off from Christ. Soaking up more and more of what sustains us through our roots. Intertwining with us like a with parasitic type intensity. Whatever you want to call this force of evil, whatever you're comfortable with, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub, its nature is to unmake what God has made, to distort it, to destroy it. As Christians, we recognize what these weeds represent, and we acknowledge their role in our life uh, Three times we renounce them at our baptism. We renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that separate us from God. We uh, renounce the evil powers of the world which corrupt and destroy all the creatures of God. And we renounce all those sinful desires that pull us away from the love of God. Not everybody can see the evil in the field that threatens uh, to cut us off from the kingdom. But 
you know, some of us can discern it. And when we think about that covenant, that, that part of our baptized life as Christians, maybe that's why some are so anxious to want to do something about the evil when they discern it and when they see it. You know, in the parable, parable, once the farm hands recognize what's happened, their first reaction is to go to pull out the weeds. And often we have that first immediate type reaction, as I mentioned earlier. It's natural to us. You know, when we think that we see or that we know the source of evil, our reaction is to, to pinpoint it and to take action against it as swiftly as possible. Now, as the farmer explained to them, it's not always possible to cut it out without risking the collateral damage. And to that point, we can look back through history at probably any number of witch hunts or things that we've went after, the retaliation against when we see a perceived evil certainly makes those of us who are trying to hunt it down feel good about ourselves. And sometimes uh, more so than we actually accomplish trying to root the evil out. Or worse, trying to root the evil out causes irreparable damage to those who are around it. It seems to me that this is what Jesus is trying to say, that the evil in the world is not something that we can always eradicate. It doesn't mean that it's pass, that to pass on pointing out injustices. We don't go and get a pass on that. You know, we still try to help people around us. We try to help recognize when evil's happening. We try to rescue. We try to cultivate the field as best we can. What Jesus leaves us with is a truth that is probably hard for us to hear. What Jesus calls us to do is don't. Don't just do something. Stand there. Not just do something. Just stand there. He invites us to rethink our human reaction and trust that in the end, God's judgment is what matters. We will ultimately be separated from the weeds that are choking us, free of the evil that surrounds us. It was like Paul said in the letter in the Romans, you know, that, that uh, when he thinks about the sufferings of the present time, that he, it pales in comparison to the glory that's to come. And it's probably two of the hardest things that we can ever do or ever be asked to do, to wait and to trust, trust in someone else that things are going to be taken care of. I think a parable that would probably resound a little better with the type of people at our church might be about the parable of the gardener and the weeds. I mean, when was the last time any of us went uh, planting and reaping any wheat? Gardens, on the other hand, can look beautiful. And if you don't believe that, just look at some of the pictures that Pam Dean has posted on Facebook of hers. They also take a lot of work. And I hate gardening. Wow, I, I think Linda, Linda just agreed with me so loudly I heard it across the internet. Linda loves it, and, and I don't. She loves to go down, get into the topsoil when it's 105 degrees outside. I like to walk into a nave that's about 70, 72 degrees and preach about it, but to each of their own, right? Uh, a few weeks ago, I did get dragged into some gardening. You know, see, across the front of our house, we have weeds. Linda calls it ivy. I call it weeds. You know, potato, potato. The one thing we agree on is it does make the house look a little prettier. In small quantities, it can give it a little bit of charm. But at some point, it crosses a line and goes from being charming to being just invasive. And what added a little attractiveness was a few weeks ago threatening to really blot out big sections of the front of our home. What was amazing to me the most was how quickly it grew. Now, this wasn't an overnight occurrence. You know, it's been around for several years, and every year we trim it back a little bit. But, but it was suddenly this year, seemingly out of nowhere. It was everywhere. And so we're outside, standing at the front of our house, and we're looking up to the second story where all of it had grown and spread out, and we're wondering, how in the heck are we ever going to get this out? Now, normally, it's very thin and vine-like, and you just get a good grip on it somewhere in the bottom, and you pull, and it just pops off. There's actually a weird satisfaction of popping it off the wall. It's like crunching bubble wrap. You know, you feel the little suction things coming off as you pull it up. Only this time, 
this time it wasn't little vines. I mean, this stuff had really, really grown in. It had grown up the walls. It had gotten behind the downspouts. Uh, it had started going under shutters. Uh, it had gotten behind the gutters on top. It was pulling against uh, windows. And it was getting thick, really thick, and starting to threaten to damage parts of the house. And it was because it was so interwoven, there was no way we could just pull it off. I mean, it took a tremendous amount of time in the very intense heat of the day, I might add, to work through a very slow process of trying to clean our homes from the vines. We had to cut it almost like a surgeon type precision at key points and try to work it out from behind those downspouts and gutters. We had to bid adieu to one of our screens. It was well past saving, but after much, much effort, we finally worked our way down towards the bottom. And as I pulled, you know, the thickest part of the vine at the, at the ground, I could literally see square feet of topsoil and mulch trying to come up. It had spread so far underneath the beds of our house. You know, the best we could do was try to cut it back as much as we could, and we'll see what happens again next year if it makes another appearance. Hopefully we'll be ready for it. But the thing that uh, frustrated me most and I think that was the most disheartening, I would want to left behind. Because along where each one of those vines had been, there were these little reminders, these little places where it had been attached, tiny spots that had shown on where it worked into the brick or the wood, places that would require a lot of cleaning to remove the evidence that had ever been there and connected. And maybe most frustrating is that as we worked all the way to pull it up, there was a portion of the topmost part of our house underneath the eaves that we couldn't reach with ladders and where there's two or three feet worth of vine that have now been cut off and has died and is just hanging there like an ugly scar sitting on top of the house. I think that's maybe one of the best descriptions I can give of how evil wraps itself around us that if we let it gain its purchase, it wraps around us, uh, it roots into everything that we do, everything about who we are, threatening to damage us with its growth. And if we can pull that evil away, you know, it's like pulling our roots up. It still leaves its fingerprints on us. It still leaves the scars of where it visited us. Some internal, some not seen, to people around us, some visible for the rest of the world to see. It's through that power of the resurrection that we are made clean of those scars that the evil causes in our life. It's through the blood of Christ that those spots are washed away. You know, for our part, we need to cultivate the field. We need to turn our hearts and our souls towards loving and caring for those around us. But again, the hardest thing that we are called to do is to wait and trust. To trust that as we nurture the field, that God ultimately will take care of the weeds. Amen. A great sermon by Deacon Dion. Thank you, Deacon. Now let's say together the Apostles' Creed found on page 96 of your Book of Common Prayer. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our service continues on page 97 of your Book of Common Prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue with suffrage A of the prayer section. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world, for only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care and guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth, your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. The Collect of the Day. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A Collect for Sunday. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A Collect for Guidance. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we will say the prayer list, the parish prayer list. If you have names that you would like to add to this, please contact us at the office. We pray especially for Tony, Glenn, Alyssa, Mary Ann, Ellen, Mike, Patrizia, Christy, Kim, Baby Brooke, Kathy, Amy Ann, the Boyd family, the Allen family, the Estes family, the Beaver family, Will, Liam, Connie, Kara, Wayne and his children, Bob and Marydale, Marcellius, Deborah, Sarah, Charles, Penny, Nancy, Tiffany, James, Carolyn, Ron, Steve, Terry, Lawana, Janet, Kevin Stitt and the whole Stitt family, for all those in leadership, for all the priests and ministers, and for all of you. Take a moment to ask God for whatever it is that you need, and also take a moment especially to thank God for the blessings in your life. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your holy church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The general thanksgiving can be found on page 101 of your Book of Common Prayer.
together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Have a great Sunday and a blessed week. Thank you.